Good evening, everyone. Hope you had a nice break. Thank you for taking the time to join us tonight. If we haven't met, I'm Kyle Hozier, the principal at the Junior Senior High School, and joined here with Ms. Johnson. Good evening. And Ms. Joseph. Hello, everyone. And our superintendent of schools, Dr. Victoria Newell. Hi, all. We, uh, we've had a lot of planning and, and a lot of work done since we last met to discuss our full day option. And we're excited to talk with you tonight about that plan and to answer questions that you may have. Yesterday, we sent out a communication that's supposed to be a broad overview of what our plan is for the remainder of the year. But we know that there are, are likely a lot of questions and we wanna take some time to answer those questions and, and make sure that we can talk specifically about a couple of areas that we uh, believe that there are questions about. So to do that, we'll first highlight some of the details related to the full day plan and the new revised six period schedule. We'll talk about the transition plan a little bit, review a couple uh, sample schedules to give you a sense of what student schedules will look like, speak about clarifying details related to the remote option lunch um, and, and other areas that have come up, and talk about next steps after tonight. And then finish with questions and answers. If you do wanna submit a question, we used a Google form um, yesterday in our email. You can submit questions using that Google form now, or you can wait until the presentation is done and submit questions at that point. In terms of our full day plan, we're gonna build on the six period schedule that we've had throughout the year. We uh, will add a uh, four minute uh, time to each instructional period. And that will thereby reduce the transition period from 72 minutes to 48 minutes. We will keep a full day option, a hybrid option and a remote option for students who want that. For students in grades 11 and 12, we have, we'll have an open campus. We know students in grades 11 and 12 are older, more mature and wanna give them flexibility. So if they wanna eat lunch on campus, they can or go off campus to have lunch during the transition period, that is also an option. For students in grades nine and 10, we will uh, allow students to be signed out by a parent or students can stay on campus. And we've put together a plan, which you'll hear a little bit more about later on to make sure that students are never uh, unsupervised and we'll use study halls to make sure that we know where students are at all times. If a student wants to go remote on a given day and the student is in the full day cohort, we will allow that. We just ask for advance notice to make sure that teachers know how to plan and so that we know who is on campus on any given day. With that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Joseph to talk a little bit about the transition and free period. Thank you, Mr. Hozier. So as we've been talking to you about the bring, bringing students back to campus full day, there's been a lot of thinking of what does that really look like? There are a lot of things that are very similar to the previous schedule, the, the hybrid schedule, besides the four minutes of instructional time being added and that the transition period being shorter, there are things that will look familiar, but there's also some different things. So similar to the previous schedule, all students will have the opportunity to go home for lunch. So if you're a hybrid student, if you're a full day student, if your parent can sign you out, you can actually go home for lunch. Grades 11 and 12, it's an open campus. So we're trying to also look at what, what is the level of independence a student deserves and, 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 and requires based on grades. So seven and eight, if you're on campus all day, every single period will be structured and supervised. Uh, nine and 10, there'll be a varying uh, decrease in terms of supervision, or there's some more freedom that's been added in. And 11 and 12, same thing, you have all these classes, but when you have a free period, it is an open campus. During the transition period, like before, hybrid PM students may enter campus from um, coming from home at the end of the transition period. So what is going to look different? So typically in grades nine and 10, they had lunch as a free period and they had free periods if there was no, uh, if there was no uh, scheduled course. What will be different now is that we will have assigned study halls for grades nine and 10 to, to reduce the amount of unsupervised unscheduled time. So you will see study halls on your student schedules if there's a free period there. But on the same token, we did want to give some level of independence to grades 9 and 10 that there may be a free period somewhere in the middle of a block, maybe block B, um, where we think they have the independence to find a designated space to maybe study or socialize. So it would be a supervised, unscheduled time that's still safe and socially distanced. And I'll explain what this looks like and some sample schedules for grades 9 and 10. 
So this is a sample schedule for a grade nine student. So if you can look at day one, for example, in block A, this student would come into campus uh, sometime before 838 and would attend their French class. If you notice on day one block B, it's a supervised unscheduled period. So they don't have a specific course that's scheduled in their, um, on their schedule. So what does that block B look like? The student can choose to go to the library, take out a book, catch up on homework. If there's some friends in the library, they could, they could socialize as long as you're socially distanced and there will be adults in the library supervising them. From that free period, block C, they have algebra, they go there. There's still seven minutes of passing time between each period and then they have lunch. So for this student on day one, they would eat lunch during the transition period because that's their, uh, that's the only free period that, that, uh, that would be supervised. Then they have living environment, then they have physical education, they have English nine. So a full day student would have all of those classes on campus. If you're a hybrid student, you could, you could go home during the transition and then come back. Or you, if you decide AM, PM, you could go home and continue classes for the PM cohort. For day two, if you notice, it's similar in some ways. There's a lunch and a study hall and a supervised unscheduled, but it's a different, different part, parts of the day. So this student would have STEAM Studio for block A, then global, then they'd have lunch during block C, and then they have another free period during, during transition. So instead of it being unsupervised, we, this student will have a, uh, a scheduled assigned study hall with a location with a teacher present. Then they'd go to algebra, then they'd have French. And then the last period is supervised unscheduled. If the student chooses to stay on campus, they're welcome to. There will be spaces for them to, again, same thing, socialize, do homework, et cetera. But if a parent chose to take the student home, they could sign them out because it's a grade nine and they could go home. Uh, day three, they'd have living environment, physical ed, block C, they have English nine. And then it flip flops. You'll see study hall is during transition. And then they have lunch, they have global and st steam studio. And if you notice this, this students day one and four are mirrored each other, two and five are mirrored and three and six. This is not always the case, electives can change that, but this is a typical grade nine schedule. Grade 10 also the same thing. They've never had study halls before, but if there's any kind of free period, we, we don't want them to be unsupervised for too long. Again, we want them to be safe. That's our primary goal. So here also you'll see the student has a pretty full schedule. On day one, they have chemistry, then they have PE, they have geometry, and then because they have no lunch assigned on day one in their schedule, they will have an opportunity to eat lunch during the transition period. Then they have AP European, Spanish, and then painting and drawing. Day two, they have health 10, they have English 10 honors, then they have lunch during C block, then they have a study hall because it, again, that's a free period, so it's gonna be a science study hall, geometry, chemistry, and chem lab. There are some cases where a student may have something like a C block, a transition and a D block free. So in that case, the lunch may be during transition again. So the schedule is gonna be tailored to some extent to what the student schedule looks like. So it's, it makes sense in terms of what the day looks like. Day three is AP European, Spanish three honors, painting and drawing, study hall and lunch are flip-flopped, English 10 honors and health 10. This also, if you look, this student schedule, one and four are mirrored, two and five are mirrored, and so are three and six. So this kind of shows you what a typical day in the life would look like for a grade 10 student with a new full day schedule. And now to Ms. Johnson, I believe. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Joseph. So as Mr. Hosier and Ms. Joseph said, this schedule provides a 48 minute long transition period. And as a reminder, grade nine and 10 students will be permitted to go home for lunch if they are assigned out by parents and grade 11 and 12 students are permitted to leave campus. It will be open campus for them. If a student decides to stay on campus for lunch, they can purchase a lunch from the cafeteria. It will be a limited menu, most likely cold um, salads or sandwiches. We're working that out with our cafeteria contractor right now, and we'll provide more details as soon as they become available. One thing that is different this year is no outside food deliveries will be allowed. And that is simply for safety and security reasons. So students in the upper grades, 11 and 12, may leave campus and go um, out for lunch. But unfortunately, we cannot have delivery people come to campus. If students choose to stay on campus for lunch, it will be a supervised area. And in the good weather, we will maximize our outdoor spaces. And we invite students to enjoy the patio, the center of campus, and other um, lovely areas on days like today and in good weather. We've gotten many questions from students and parents about lockers. And yes, we will make those available to students. 
Unfortunately, we do not have enough lockers for every student on campus, but typically most seniors and many juniors um, decline. They do not want a locker. So in the next few days, you can ask your student to be on the lookout for a Google form that we will ask them to fill out if they do want a locker. Now we are going to give priority to our seventh and eighth graders. We believe that our younger students, um, they have many more books and they're not as strong to carry their backpacks and we need to give them priority for their lockers. But hopefully if your child wants a locker, they will be able to have one. And then we'll send out a form in the next few days. Um, like Mr. Hosier said, we believe this option will maximize full day for students. We do believe that's uh, vital for students to be on campus, but we do recognize that you may have to remain hybrid either in the AM or PM cohort or even fully remote. Uh, we do ask, however, that if you are going to choose to either remain or move to a fully remote option, that you do so if it's medically necessary for your student or for your family member. We know that many students, um, particularly our older students, have enjoyed sleeping in, um, sort of rolling out of bed and doing their first class online, or they've just gotten comfortable with learning from home. And while we recognize that, we do believe it's healthy for them, both mentally, socially, physically, to get back into a routine and to get back on campus if it is safe for them and for their family members. So please, when you do fill out the Google form that will go out about your cohort preference, please choose remote only if, if that's something you truly need for medical reasons. And now I'll send it back to Mr. Hozier. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. In terms of our next steps later tonight, I will send out an email that has these presentation slides, uh, the link to watch the recording if anyone was not able to attend tonight, and a Google form that parents can use to select the new cohort for their child. And we are asking parents to make that uh, submission by 3 p.m. on Friday, April 9th. We need those numbers to have a better sense of how many students are gonna go full day, hybrid and remote, and then to identify how many students will be on campus during the uh, transition period. After school tomorrow, we have two separate meetings with students and the links for those meetings will be sent out later tonight. Once we have all the information from the Google form, we will use that information to determine how many study halls we need, where students will be placed for lunch. And then we will use that information to update student schedules on Infinite Campus. We know it's important for students and families to be able to look at a schedule and know exactly where a student's gonna be. I think it, once we have that, a lot of questions that, that you may have will be answered. So we will update schedules uh, next week once we have all of the information to know who will be on campus during the transition period, how many study halls we need, and make sure that as much information is represented on schedules as possible in Infinite Campus. With that, we'd like to uh, open it up to questions. Again, in the communication that went out yesterday, we uh, used a, uh, included a Google form. So if you do have questions, please take some time to answer questions using that Google form. And Ms. Johnson, when you're ready, we'll start answering the, the first question. All right, I had a little trouble unmuting myself. Here's the first question. Will students get mask breaks if they are full day students? And also what is being done about bathrooms? Yes, uh, mask breaks, uh, we've not needed mask breaks as much because students have been on campus for half the day, but mask breaks would be treated as though a bathroom break where if you're inside, you have to leave your mask on. But if a student needed to take a mask break, the student could uh, go outside for two or three minutes and then come back inside and, and uh, of course be more than six feet, feet away from anyone while the mask is removed. The next question is about transportation. Um, a parent writes that her senior is her ninth grader's transportation since the parents work. If the ninth grader wanted to leave during transition or at the end of the day, um, could a parent sign her out remotely? Yes, uh, so we will, in order for parents to sign students out, every morning you should receive an easy screen reminder. In that email, we will include a Google form for parents to sign their child out. And if a senior is gonna drive their younger sibling home, that would be permitted. The next question is similar. It's about signing students out every day. 
Um, do parents have to sign students out every day or can it be a blanket sign out? For example, if a child has a free period, block D. We will uh, have two lists. If parents indicate that their child would go home every single day during the transition period, we wouldn't need a parent to indicate that every single day. But if a parent indicates that a student will go home sometimes, let's say on days two and day four, we would wanna know that. So we'd ask parents to complete the Google form indicating that the child would leave each day on day two and then day four. Next question is about sort of easing into this. Can a student start this full day option um, in a hybrid model and then in a week or two, if they feel comfortable, ease into the full day mode? Great question. That is actually one of the biggest reasons why we're keeping the hybrid model. Students who were remote all year may have a difficult time coming back for the full day. So our hope is that anyone who is remote, who wants to come back, could use the hybrid option or go immediately to full day. But if you start with a hybrid option, hopefully by the end of the year, the student would feel comfortable to be back full day and be well positioned for when school starts in September. The next question is about senior options. When do seniors start options? And could you confirm that juniors will be allowed to park on campus once the senior options start? Uh, May 14th is the last day of classes for seniors. So senior options begins on May 17th. And I can confirm that juniors will be permitted to park on campus once seniors go on uh, senior options. Great. There's a couple questions I think you answered, but it probably bears repeating. Um, a nine or 10th grader, if they walk to school, could they walk home for lunch if a parent either sends in a note or somehow notifies? Could they walk home on their own? Yes, provided the parent completed the Google form for that day, given permission for the child to leave. That, that would be uh, allowed, yes. Great. The next question is, for students who are full day on campus, would they be able to be remote as needed if something came up um, you know, at home, would they be able to switch into fully remote or even to hybrid? Ms. Joseph, would you like to take that one? Yeah. I think one of the positives of our schedule has been that we've allowed families to make choices based on their needs. We understand that from day to day, things could change and a parent may need to opt for a remote, but we do understand the value in structure, routine, and predictability for students and teachers alike. So when you commit to a cohort, we would like you to stay with that cohort, but we completely understand that there are extenuating circumstances. So we would definitely um, allow for that to happen. Ms. Joseph, there's another question here that is a good follow-up to your answer. It says, can you please clarify the remote only if medically necessary? Does that mean we should not use this option if there is no medical reason to stay home? I, go ahead. I was going to start, but Mr. Hosier, if you want to just add no, on. No, please, to Ms. Joseph, go ahead. I think, I think the idea is that the purpose of this plan is to bring all students back to full day on campus. That's the ultimate goal, as long as everyone feels safe and is safe. If you feel or if your family feels that there's a medical reason or a health reason that, that, that would make you feel unsafe to come back to campus full day or even hybrid, we, we respect that choice and we want you to make that choice. On the same token, it, that is not the only reason why a parent chooses remote. There are many other reasons why a parent chooses remote. Um, so please engage us in conversation about that. Um, there are reasons why a parent chooses remote besides medical options. Mr. Hosier, if you want to add to that. Yeah, I, I would just say that it's, um, we know that for some students, once they've gotten to a routine, it's hard to break that routine. So if your routine is to be remote, that's how you might want to finish the year. And we want to encourage students and families to rethink the value of creating a new routine of being on campus. Of course, you have to be comfortable with that, but we think it's gonna be easier to make the transition to come back now than to wait for the entire year and come back in September. So yes, we know that some families need to have children stay remote and we appreciate that, which is why we're gonna leave that option for the remainder of the year, but we do invite and, and encourage students to come back when they're ready. If I could just add on to that too, in terms of the experts we've consulted, um, in terms of uh, psychiatrists and, and counselors, in, in terms of the mental health of our students, the, the remote option for, for those who have uh, chosen it for, for reasons beyond 
medical is kind of playing into that adolescent need to stay in bed longer and to, um, to uh, maybe not push themselves as much as they could. And, and our, one of our goals also is to try to provide that structure and help you, for those of you who've maybe wanted to um, get your students back to campus and it's been difficult, we will partner with you to do that because all of the experts have been recommending uh, that it's healthier um, for, for mental health purposes to, for the students to get them back um, if we can. Thank you. The next question is, um, other than a longer class periods and shorter transition, will students' schedules remain the same as they are now? Yes, uh, classes don't change, teachers don't change. It's truly a 45 minute class to 49 minutes and the transition period goes from 72 minutes down to 48. Thank you. The next question is, what happens when a student has several frees in a row? For example, transition, then lunch, and then another free. What do they do for all of that free time? So if we use the example of a student, let's say a student has C, transition, and then D block, we wanna make sure that a ninth or 10th grader isn't on, um, unstructured and don't doesn't have a place to go for too long because then poor decisions can be made. So in a scenario like that, the student would likely have lunch during C block, study hall during the transition, and then a free period where they go to the library, can be outside, just like they would have pre-COVID. But we again, we want to put that study hall in there and we will take attendance to make sure that students aren't unscheduled for too long during the middle of the day because that we think could provide an opportunity to make poor decisions. Will students have assigned seating at lunch so we know who to contact if a case occurs? Ms. Joseph, would you like to take that? Yeah, uh, students will be assigned specific spaces. We're looking into some sort of system that works in terms of taking attendance. Mr. Hosier had mentioned some local schools are using a QR code to scan which would help with contact tracing to see where students sit. So it is helpful in terms of knowing where students are, that's the whole purpose, and then also where they're sitting. So there would be assigned spaces for students and they can, and be able to take attendance based on that. Can children come home during study hall? If a, if a student wanted to go home during study hall, yes, um, but be mindful that if you have 48 minutes, just is that enough time? Now with the passing period, that's actually 62 minutes because passing period is seven minutes on each side. So yes, that would be an option. But again, we would just wanna know in advance if your child was gonna leave campus and we'd ask parents to complete the Google form. The next question is similar. Um, this parent writes that they do not live close to the school and they worry that 48 minutes for lunch um, with, and their child walks, that that might not be enough time. Would the child be excused if he arrives late to his next class? Yeah, so, so it is 48 minutes for the transition period, but if you add in the seven minutes prior for passing and the seven minutes after, it is 62 minutes. And we were trying to find the sweet spot that allows students to go home if they need to, but also isn't too long that where it would create a supervision problem. I, I can't imagine that if someone walked in two minutes late because they had walked home for the beginning of D block, that that would be a huge issue. But hopefully we do think that the 62 minutes does provide enough time. The next question is about students who would like to continue hybrid for a week or two and then transitioning to full day. What should they select um, on the Google form? Would they select hybrid or would they select full day? Select hybrid if that's your plan to start for a week or two. And again, just like we've gotten emails where um, students have asked or parents have asked for their children to go from AM to PM or from uh, a small group has gone from hybrid to full day already, we would uh, of course receive those emails and then make a change immediately. The next question is about if a study hall is next to lunch, can the student go home for, for both, both periods? Yes. yes, that is permitted. All right. Let me just go back to our other Google form. Um, here's a question about uh, health and safety. Um, this parent points to a recent rise of the COVID-19 cases, particularly the variants, 
And they're wondering about how we're going to address that with fuller classrooms now that we're inviting students to come back full day. Yeah, if you are watching the news, you can see there's a tension between the COVID rates that we see and the number of people who are vaccinated every single day. And so it's, you know, it's a race to get people vaccinated as soon as possible. We know that for some families, they're not ready to have their children back on campus full day. And that's why we want to continue to provide a hybrid option and a remote option. We also know that in terms of tr transmission on school and on campus, there's a lot that we can do to mitigate risk. And so uh, making sure that students always have masks on, making sure adults have masks on, making sure that students are washing their hands. Um, we've just installed the barriers, the sneeze guards in classrooms on desk. And we think all of those things are moving in a direction to address the health and safety concerns. We will continue to, to look at those rates. And um, I would say that's one of the reasons why we chose this model as opposed to the nine period day. Thank you. The next question, I think you've answered, but there's quite a few questions about it. Would students be able to alternate? For example, choose the full day model, but go hybrid on some days, maybe even go fully remote according to their needs. Could they sort of pick and choose? The hope and expectation would be that if you're full day that you're on campus. If there is a time where something comes up and you let teachers know in advance so that they can plan and we can we know who's on campus, we, we know and expect that that will happen and we're comfortable with that. We want to try to avoid students going remote on one day, being on campus the next day and then going remote again. I think it, it's again we're trying to make sure that students have structure and routine and we the inability to know who's going to be on campus presents a real challenge. But if you have a unique circumstance um, that makes it so that that is something that you need to do, please reach out to us so we can talk about that option. The next question, a parent writes that um, her 10th grader has the first two periods free on days three and six. Should they stay at home for those periods or come in and wait around? And then on other days of the cycle, the 10th grader has double freeze later in the day. Would they eat lunch and then have a study hall? How would it work with all of the free periods? Would you like to take that, Ms. Johnson? Sure. Yes, so if your student has the first two periods free, um, of course they're welcome to come to campus if they want to get some work done, maybe even socialize, but you can certainly keep them at home for those two periods and then just come in late. Um, most people have done that since September this year. Uh, if they don't have a block A class, they come in for block B. And similarly, if they don't have a block C, they'll go home at the end of block B. So we definitely encourage you to continue to do that if that works for your family. But we will have places for students to go where they will be supervised for those that need and or want to come in. The next question is about PE. If, if it's a student athlete and they are signed out of PE, um, is that, does that still count as a free period? So every student, in, in, even in a non-COVID year, is required to have a lunch period and a free period unless they want to take a performing arts or fine arts course. And so even if a student is an athlete and they sign out of physical education, we still keep that physical education class on student schedules, knowing that the seasons don't perfectly align with when quarters end. So if the season ends, then the student would have to go into the physical education class. Or, and it's unfortunate that this happens, but sometimes students do get injured and can no longer participate in that athletic team and then would go back into physical education. So uh, it, no, we don't remove that physical education class from the student schedule. It does stay there as a placeholder, knowing that the student may need to go back into the class at some point during the year. Thank you. Here's a question from a parent whose child is currently um, PM cohort, and they think they might stay hybrid, but they would love to move to the AM cohort. Is that possible under this new model? The Google form that will be shared later tonight does allow a student who's in the PM cohort to move to the AM cohort. So that is an option, yes. Great, the next question is from a parent of an A school student. 
Are there any special accommodations for the A school during the transition? Are they expected to remain in school or any um, plans for those who might choose to stay? A school is for students in grades 11 and 12. And so knowing that students in 11th and 12th grade have an open campus, so they're not required to stay. They can if they choose to, but they're permitted to leave campus knowing that it will be an open campus for the remainder of the year. Here's a question about lunch. Um, how would kids be able to buy lunch? Can they use cash? Is it pay for it? How will they be able to purchase a lunch? We, we do have a system called pay for it. And before we implement this um, full day option, we'll communicate with families so you know how to put money into the pay for it system. We do not plan on using cash. Uh, it will be card only. So if your child doesn't have their ID, it would be important to get that ID now and we'll send more information about how to put money into that system so students are prepared when uh, the full day option begins. This parent wonders what has changed. Um, the parent was at our previous parent meetings where we said that it would not be possible to offer full day instruction while retaining the six block schedule. So what, what's different now that we are able to do it? Yeah, great, great question. And I think it was important for us to do the first survey with the first um, AM PM schedule to, to the second survey with the nine period schedule to really get a sense of what does the community want to happen for the remainder of the year. And all of that feedback from all of the different stakeholders has brought us to where we are today. And we saw that there was really a demand to keep the current schedule, but offer a full day option. So to do that, we had to get a little more creative and we had to partner with uh, community organizations. So grade seven and eight, rather than uh, students having a free period, they will work with the nature center and the digital arts experience. And that gives us a lot more fle flexibility for faculty and staff to work with upperclassmen during that time. The fact that the classes are now four minutes longer and the transition period is now only 48 minutes, that completely changes the way we can supervise students. And the other thing I would add is that uh, rather than thinking about students only having lunch during the transition period, we thought a little bit more and realized we have more options if students eat in C block, transition in D block. And so those minor changes have made a big difference to offer the schedule that we have today. Thank you. This next one, I think we've answered, but it probably bears repeating. It says for ninth graders and really any student who are doing full day at school, they can still come home for lunch, correct? And if they have a lunch adjacent to transition or a free, they can use both periods to come home for lunch, correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, the next question is similar. What if a student has a free in between classes? What should students do? And um, you know, will they be told where to go? Ms. Joseph, would you like to take that question? Yeah, it, it really depends on where it falls in the schedule. I mean, each instructional period is 49 minutes. So if you live really close and there's parent support that you could even go home if you really wanted. But if not, there are assigned and designated spaces for students to be on campus. Grades nine and 10, you will be assigned a study hall. 11 and 12, it's an open campus. So if you have a free period and you're, and you're a junior, you could choose to leave campus or you could choose to go to the library and study or socialize. So there are spaces for students to be supervised um, and unsupervised depending on the grade. Thank you. So here's a question, it's not about the schedule, but I'm sure it's on the mind of many people. It's about final exams and regents. Um, what is the plan for, for those finals and regents? Hard to believe that we're at a point in the year where we need to start thinking about June finals regents and to understand what that, that plan looks like, but we are getting close. So uh, with final exams, we're not gonna have a finals testing period. Um, we do think that some teachers may have a, uh, end of quarter assessments that would be similar to quarter one, two, and three, but we won't have three hour finals uh, that students take for their courses, nor do we expect a three hour final to be divided across five or six days. That, that's not going to happen. And then with Regents exams, the state has uh, sent communication indicating that they're gonna offer several uh, Regents exams, including the English Regents, the Earth Science, Living Environment, and Algebra. At the same time, they've also said remote students do not need to take the Regents. And if you pass the course that culminates in a Regents exam, 
you are exempt from the test and you don't have to take it. So um, we're in conversations with our teachers to say, is there an advantage to having students take these uh, regions exams? And we're gonna use that to um, make a decision on how we communicate about regions exams. But that's where we stand at this point, And we'll have more information about regions exams moving forward. But students will not be compelled to take regions exams. Thank you. Here's a couple questions about next fall. Um, will we still have fully remote and hybrid options for the fall? Uh, do we have a plan for those students? And will students be required to get the COVID vaccine? Dr. Newell, would you like to take that one? Ah, uh, yes, happy to talk about that. We don't yet know from the state of New York, from the state education department, if uh, there, we will still be allowed to have a remote only option and to be able to give credit for that. So we will, uh, as always through the year, follow the direction from the state education department and the New York State Department of Health. Uh, we do plan to be in, in school full-time in-person instruction. Um, at this point, uh, we are not able to mandate vaccinations for anyone, not for students and, and not for adults. Um, but we, we again, will we'll follow the direction that comes our way in that regard. We do know that uh, students and all of the adults uh, who have been able to um, have been taking advantage of the vaccination opportunities. Thank you. A couple more questions about the sign out procedure. Uh, for example, can students who walk to and from school leave during the transition without being signed out? And will there be a sign out for lunch option on the daily easy screen or some other way to sign their children out? Again, grades 11 and 12 open campus so they don't need to be signed out. Grades nine and 10, yes, we would use the um, easy screen email. We'll include a link in there. So the parents could sign their kids out. And we would, again, if it's every single day, we wouldn't require you to do it every day because we would have a separate list for those families. But if it's on a day-to-day -day basis, we would ask families to complete that every day that the student was gonna leave during the day. Next question is about the food. Could we be more specific? What type of food will students be able to purchase? Will it be prepared in the school cafeteria or will it come from an outside vendor? We work with a company called Whitson's and actually we just had a conversation, a meeting today uh, to talk about what those options will look like. We know there'll be cold options, likely a couple different sandwiches and a salad option. The, uh, the challenge that we have is we wanna provide options to students, but we know with every option we provide, it's more choice and it's more time for students to pick up their lunch. And we wanna make sure that students have plenty of time to eat lunch safely so we're gonna start with a limited menu and as things go very smoothly, we are likely to add in more options after the first couple of weeks. Some more lunch questions. Are students allowed to bring in their own lunch? Yes, yes they can. And where, where will they eat if they stay all day? So on nice weather days, uh, we'd love to use the outdoors as much as possible. We have a beautiful campus outdoors for students. And so we, we would use that. When we do have uh, more problematic weather, we have identified several locations. Some of those include the cafeteria, cafeteria annex, the back of the cafeteria. San Marco gym is not scheduled for anything other than for uh, lunch periods. So there's a lot of space there as well. And during the transition period, we have a lot of options because there are no classes going on that, at that point. So again, once, uh, and this is why it's so important for families to complete the Google form. Once we have a good sense of the numbers, we will assign those spaces and make sure that that information is, in, is included on student schedules in the Infinite Campus. Here's another lunch question. Will students be able to eat lunch with their friends or will they be assigned uh, tables or spaces for eating? We expect to have um, students assigned by grades to certain locations, but I don't think that we're gonna say students have to sit together and assign like that. We do want students to have some flexibility, but again, likely we'll use a QR code for attendance purposes, just to make sure that if we had to contact Trace that we can do that. Great, will students get a new schedule? Schedules don't change. So your classes stay the same, your teachers stay the same. 
when we say we'd like to update the schedule, it really just means that if we add a study hall to your schedule for you to be able to see that on your schedule, or if we assign you to a specific place for lunch to make sure that that's on your schedule so you can see that. Here's a question from a parent who, um, for medical reasons that they have, um, you know, an, a true medical need to keep their student fully remote, and they're concerned, would it, will that negatively impact the grades? Will teachers um, understand that in some cases, staying fully remote is necessary? Will it harm their child? No, it, I think, uh, you know, we're, have been very flexible this year and will continue to be flexible. Our teachers know that there are reasons why families may need a child to stay home and respect those choices. So there'd be no reason to think that a student would be negatively impacted by making that choice. We, we want students to come back when they're ready, but also understand that we're gonna have a certain percentage that, it, that stays remote for the entire year. Um, there's a question here about AP exams, which I'll be happy to answer. It says AP tests on Thursday, May 13th have been moved to Monday, May 17th. That is true. Are there alternate test dates for those with prior commitments? Um, and the answer is there may be, there likely are. Um, and your child should talk to their teacher and or reach out to me and we can discuss those. Um, so the short answer is yes, there are. And you should just reach out to me and we can, we can talk more detail about that. Okay, on to the next question. Um, sorry, I'm switching to the next Google form. Um, Children 16 and over are now allowed to get vaccines in New York. Do we suggest that students get them? Will COVID vaccines be required? Dr. Newell, would you like to take that? Yeah, I would certainly talk to your um, pediatrician and your uh, medical provider. Um, and uh, there is no plan that I have heard of that students will be required to be vaccinated. And here's another one about the uh, random COVID surveillance testing that we've recently started. Is it possible to opt out of it? Yes, it's possible. Um, you can uh, contact, probably contact Ms. Johnson uh, to, <laughs> to opt out of it. And also we will be sending another consent form out because now that we'll have more students on campus, we'll be giving parents uh, an opportunity to opt in for, for random surveillance testing. Yes, just to be very clear, um, you have to opt in. It's not an opt out procedure, but if you've already opted in and now mm -hmm. you choose to opt out, mm -hmm. just send me an email and I will remove your child from the list. But um, just to be very clear, it's opt in. And if you'd like to opt in, like Dr. Nemo said, we'll send that out and we would, we would love it and greatly appreciate it. It helps us keep all of us safe. And we did testing today. And fortunately, we had all negative for COVID test results, which was fantastic. Um, here's the next question. The parent says, I just wanna make sure I understand your answer. If a ninth or 10th grader has a C block lunch, um, transition study hall, and then D block free, could a parent sign the student out for all three periods? Yes, yes. If a, if a student doesn't have a class and the student and parent want the child to go home, that, that will be offered. Just knowing that um, you know, we wanna use the time that students are on campus for class and then be flexible with the rest of that time. Here's a great question. Are there any steps going to be taken to address the mental health of the students returning to school for the first time? I think uh, that is a fantastic question. And I, that is one of the reasons why um, recognizing that some students have had a very hard time being uh, home and that the transition coming back to school can be very difficult. I think we, we work very close, closely with our counselors and psychologists and our grade seven, eight and nine team leaders to have a good sense of where students are. And so we do have those individual conversations and offer those support to families. And if you see that you have a child that really is struggling to come back, love for you to reach out for us. Um, maybe we can answer some questions that help smooth that transition and then point in the right direction of who we can speak to on campus to make sure you have that support. The next question is, do parents still need to do the Easy Screen app every morning before school? 
Yes, yes. So uh, students and adults on campus, anyone that's on campus has to complete that easy screen um, attestation. And any guest that comes in, we have a paper form that uh, guests have to complete. And as a follow-up to that, this parent points out that we're going into allergy season. And if a child coughs or sneezes, but no fever, would they still be allowed to come to school? Yes, I think answer the uh, easy screen questions as honestly as possible. And we do know that something like allergies, there are reasons why someone may cough or sneeze and we would address that then. If it's allergy related, then no, the student wouldn't have to be excluded from school. We may need some documentation from a doctor just to indicate that, but if that happens, please give me a call in the morning if your child's in that position. Here's a question from a parent about the Google form deadline. Is it possible to extend it to Monday so they can have the weekend to think about all the options that are offered? So with most deadlines, uh, it's not a hard deadline. We're not gonna shut off the Google form. Uh, we appreciate that more time would be helpful. Uh, there is some tension between making sure that families have time to think about what's best. And uh, then on our end, to make sure that we have the weekend to do some of the work that needs to be done. So if you can complete this by Friday, please do so. We know that for some families, it's gonna be a conversation over the weekend and we'll see the information Monday morning. Here's another question just to clarify about free periods in study hall. The parent writes, if a 10th grader has a free in the middle of the day, not adjacent to transition, will they now be assigned a specific room for a study hall or will they be allowed to choose where they hang out, the library, outside, et cetera? Pre-COVID, uh, students in grade nine and 10 and 11 and 12, they, there are no study halls. So uh, if there is a free period in block B or free period in block E, no, we would not assign a study hall to students during that time. You can be outside, you can go to the library. What's different is if the time is adjacent to the transition period, that's a too large of a time period. It makes us worry. Again, we wanna make sure that students are supervised. So that's why we would have a study hall either during the transition or adjacent. But if it's an in-between period, no, we wouldn't do that. And students can go to the library, they can be outside, uh, they could be in the cafeteria, knowing that no one's eating lunch at that time. So we do have options, but no, we wouldn't place students in the study hall at that point. Here's another question about free periods or lunch periods. If a student's assigned lunch period falls in block A, will that instead be a free? And then will the student eat during the transition? Yes, so block A would become a free period and provided there are no other free periods adjacent to the transition, uh, transition period. So if you have a class in C and D, the student would eat lunch during the transition period. Here's a question about lunch options. Um, will there be menus available? Yes, uh, again, we're still working on what those options are. So once we have that set, and I would say that that's the cafeteria now is uh, before we had to put together like the big picture of what this looks like. And now we're going through all of the details. And as soon as we have that information, we'll share it with the community. A question from a parent with a ninth grade student, will there be an option to take an elective during any freeze or during lunch? We uh, won't be adding any additional classes at this point. Um, you know, we're almost finishing the third quarter. So we don't have the ability to offer additional classes to students who have a free period. Um, there's a lot that would have to go into that. We would need uh, increased staffing. There would have to be room in classes to do that. And again, with just a quarter left, that's not an option that we have at this point. Here's a question about an English Regents, which I'm just happy to answer. The question is in which grade is it given? And it's given in grade 11. The next question is, if a 10th grader is doing a spring sport and does not have to take PE, can he come home during that class with parent permission? Yes. Another question about schedule, will they see a change schedule on the parent portal? Yes, it will likely not change until next week because we need the information from this uh, Google form in order to know how many study halls, in order to know where we're gonna place students. So it will be probably middle of next week that we will be able to update Infinite Campus to include the new locations and new study halls on student schedules. 
Here's a question about the faculty and staff at the high school. How many of the faculty and staff are vaccinated and how much are they encouraged to get the vaccine? So I can answer that. Uh, everyone is encouraged to get vaccinated. Um, I, I have led the way and uh, tweeted my photo after my vaccination. Uh, we know that uh, more than 50% of all of the adults in the district have been vaccinated. Thank you, Dr. Newell. Um, here's a question about AP exams that I'm happy to answer. It says, could you please clarify um, about AP exams, in particular, what happens if the student decides not to take the exam in May? So this year, all AP exams are optional. We know that it's not the most ideal um, situation. And so we've suspended our typical rule that if you're enrolled in the course, you must take the exam. And we've suspended that to make it optional. Um, I've been emailing students quite regularly and many, many have emailed me saying, you know, please remove me from that roster. So if your student opts not to take an exam, they should get in contact with their teacher first, of course, and then with me, and I will remove them for the exam. And they have some flexibility. They could decide you know, fairly last minute, although in the next week or so, we will be collecting um, payment for that. So I encourage them to decide before they pay just to avoid a situation of refunds and, and any kind of um, you know, uh, money issue. And Mr. Hosier, that was our last question. I'm just gonna look back and see if I skipped anything. Parents, I invite you, if we didn't clarify or you had something that we didn't address, please add it. But I do believe that was our final question. Great, thank you, Ms. Johnson. And thank you for submitting all those questions. We, we do encourage you to reach out to us if you have other questions that you think of after tonight. We know that uh, until this is set, you're likely to have a lot of questions. And so we, we're welcome the opportunity to answer those questions. Uh, please look for the email that's sent out later tonight from us. Again, it's so helpful to have as much information as possible. So we're encouraging everyone to complete the Google form. Um, that information will help make sure we have a seamless transition to the full day option. Please encourage your friends to com complete the Google form. Uh, we wanna try to get as many people to complete that as possible. And thank you for your patience and feedback throughout this process. We know heading into the break, there was some anxiety of what schedule would we end up with. Uh, we hope that you can see that based on the feedback we provided uh, from you and from students and from faculty and staff, we try to put all that together and come up with the plan that you heard about tonight. And so thank you for taking all the time to speak with us, to share feedback. And Ms. Johnson, you look like you may have one more question. Yes, yeah, so we have a couple uh, late, late breaking okay, questions great. here. Um, one is just to, it's a, to clarify about finals. Um, how will grades be weighted? You know, how does that change the uh, calculation of grades? All right, so uh, four quarters weighted evenly. The one exception might be seniors because of senior options. Um, teachers will decide if the fourth quarter for seniors are weighted a little bit less for fourth quarter as compared to the first three quarters. But generally speaking, four quarters averaged equally um, would come up with the final grade on the transcript. And that's the perfect segue into the next question because it's about seniors and senior options and how long would they be back if they opt into full day before starting senior options? When, when would the full day start? So we had a, a conversation with some students, uh, with some seniors, and there was a request to make sure that seniors were included in that first group that comes back on April uh, uh, 15th. And so seniors would come back with seventh and eighth graders on the 15th. And the last day of classes for seniors is May 14th. So just about a month. Great. And then the last question I'm happy to answer is about AP exams again. It says, if the student does not take the exam, will the AP course still be recorded as AP on the transcript? And yes, it will. Um, as long as a student successfully completes the course with a passing grade, they would earn um, the honors uh, GPA bump for that course. And it would be titled advanced placement, um, whatever the course is on the transcript. So the exam is independent of that. They would still earn um, the honors and the, the title on their transcript. Great. And with that, just wanna thank everyone again. Please reach out to us if you have questions and um, looking forward to the remainder of the year. Wanna to try to make it a fantastic experience and look forward to having more students back on campus. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye.